Tonight, Egypt beefs up digital surveillance. YouTube rejoices in Turkey. And Google says it's fixing encryption. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 100 for Tuesday, June 3rd, 2014. Happy 100, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. The Guardian reports that Egypt's police force wants to build a surveillance system to monitor social media for expressions of dissent. According to a leaked document, Egypt's interior ministry says it wants the ability to scan apps like Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and Viber in real time for usage that might harm public security or incite terrorism. The ministry asks for a system that could dredge up, quote, vocabulary, which is is contrary to law and public morality and could include, quote, degrading and acerbic ridicule, slander, insult, the use of profanity, incitement of extremum, extremism, violence and rebellion, demonstrations, sit-ins and illegal strikes and pornography and decadence, immorality and debauchery and the publication of ways to manufacture explosives. Explosive part, I definitely agree with. Egyptian rights activists are criticizing the move, saying it's too vague and the terms are too broad. Egypt's interior minister, Mohammed Ibrahim, says, quote, the new system will not affect by any measure the freedom of opinion and expression, according to MENA, which is Egypt's state-run news agency. They've had some trouble in the past, though, so I can understand why people are worried. Speaking of other countries, 67 days after the Turkish government blocked YouTube, the video sharing service is back on in the country. Turkey's Telecommunications Authority, or TIB, lifted the ban today on YouTube from the blocked sites listed on its website. The move came four days after the country's constitutional court ruled that the ban violated Turks' free speech rights and ordered that the ban be lifted. The constitutional court reached the ruling after reviewing three separate appeals. One was by Google, one by the country's bar Association, Association and one by a local scholar. Back on March 27, Turkey blocked YouTube after an anonymous user posted leaked recordings of an alleged high security meeting among Turkey's intelligence chief, foreign minister, and the deputy head of the armed forces, during which they discussed potential military operations against Syria. Let's switch gears. Kickstarter is relaxing its rules. The kind of rules that define the kind of projects that can be crowdfunded on the service. Co-founder and CEO Yancey Strickler notes in an announcement today that going forward, Kickstarter will now only prohibit projects that are expressly illegal, regulated, or dangerous, and pretty much everything else is fair game as long as the creators are honest about what they're doing. Charity, genetically modified organisms, and misleading photorealistic renderings, those are still forbidden under the rules, but things like sunglasses, bath and beauty products, and other items that were banned over time are now back in the game. The check for violations will now be done by an algorithm that looks at keywords in a campaign, the creator's track record on Kickstarter and other metrics to create a profile of the project and compare it to similar projects that have either been approved, rejected, flagged, or removed in the past. If the campaign passes the algorithmic check, the creator can choose to either launch without a human review or request feedback from the Kickstarter team. Instagram has added some pro tools to its iOS and Android apps in version 6, which is rolling out to users today. I haven't gotten mine yet, though. New sliders control nine new photo effects and the intensity of existing filters, which CEO Kevin Systrom says gives everyone the power of desktop editing suites and photo apps like Camera Plus and Photoshop Express, but for free, which Systrom says, quote, creates a nice level playing field for the Instagram community whatever that means. Along with more filter options are new contrast, vignette, sharpening, warmth, color tools, all designed to give more options to Instagram's now 200 million plus community. In just a minute, who hates WWDC? The answer may surprise you. But first, let's talk about Google. And joining us to do so is Josh Ong, U.S. editor at The Next Web. Hey, Josh. Hi, thanks for having me back. Well, thanks for coming back. I wasn't sure if you would. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so let's talk about Google kind of scaring people and saying, listen, Gmail is pretty secure. Gmail has always used encryption in transit using transport layer security or TLS. But based on the client that someone might have on the other side, 
up to 50% of emails between you using Gmail and someone else aren't even encrypted. Yeah, it was a huge name and shame. I, I mean, Comcast is really the one who looks pretty embarrassed. I saw a joke out on Twitter um, from, I think, Chris uh, Segoyan, who from ACLU, and, and he's like, if AOL has has that level of encryption, right, and you're coming in beneath them, that just looks bad. So, now didn't Google get criticized in the past for stripping out encryption in order to be able to read the contents of emails in order to be able to serve up ads ads to people like us? So, is this a little bit of a hey, Google didn't you used to do the same thing, and now you're just calling out other companies? I, well, I think there's there's a bit of a conflict on Google's part, and it has to go through this identity crisis, which is that to be an advertising company, to collect the kind of data that it does, to organize the world's information, um, you know, the concepts of privacy haven't always been, and security haven't always been kind of at, at the forefront like they could have been for different organizations. Now, recently, I think Google's really um, doubled down, so to speak, on security um, Sergey Brin said at CodeCon that they have um, over about a thousand people in their security division. Um, they've got some really great experts who are working on 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 those products, and you're seeing them start to um, prioritize uh, encryption, and that will affect their ability to, to target with their marketing. But um, but I think they're they understand that from a long term perspective, it's important for them to you know, protect their business to consumers as much as it is to run that kind of um, data. And speaking of consumers, the company's launching a new tool. It's an alpha called End to End um, as a Chrome extension for those who use Chrome that's supposed to allow users like us to encrypt data leaving the browser. So what does that mean? It's just for developers. Now they're testing for bugs before they roll it to the public. But what does that mean as a, as a, as a service that then I can use? Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. What it's trying to do is take Open PGP, which has been a um, cryptography cryptography standard that's been you know very popular for those that that need that high level of near military grade um, encryption, um, and making it easier to use. Uh, one of the big complaints about PGP is that really you have to be kind of super technical or or very almost paranoid, let's say. To, to really want to set it up and to use it. And so this tool will work from kind of Chrome to Chrome and is designed to, to make it much easier to use. And interestingly, um, um, I don't know how to say his name, but Stefan Samogi, who wrote the post for Google um, and worked on the product, was the director of products at the PGB Corporation previously. And one of the contributors to the project as well used to work for the NSA and was a global network exploitation and vulnerability analyst for six years. So take that as you will, but hopefully he can take his experience and help make this tool, um, you know, really great protection for, um, for us. End-to-end -end encryption is, is, if you recall, something that Edward Snowden himself really pushed quite heavily when he um, gave his talk at, remotely at uh, South by Southwest. So... Um, you know, this would be great, and I'd love to see it rolled into, you know, Gmail and kind of somehow them really find a way to take this from its alpha version and bring it down to um, to consumers and to everyday users who who are interested in that kind of privacy and heading off the kind of mass data collection that something like the NSA has really pushed. All right, switching gears, but still in the Google universe, Chromecast got uh, support today for Watch ESPN, Major League Soccer, Google Plus Photos, also Crunchyroll, which can never stay off any set-top box, apparently. Not that I have any problem with Crunchyroll specifically, but we've got Android TV coming out. The details are still somewhat sparse. It hasn't been announced officially what it's going to be like, but how do you see Chromecast and the future Android TV, whatever it may be, living side by side? You know, I think Chromecast and the, you know, rumored Android TV, they're not really going to live side by side so much as more vertically, maybe top and bottom. Um, I think Chromecast is this great impulse buy, but I'll be honest, a lot of people I know who bought one, they aren't using it now. Hmm. Um, you know, or at, at least not like daily. Um, you know, I've got one, but I end up kind of unplugging it. And the truth is I have like 
on my TV and in my living room, I have six different ways to connect to Netflix. And Chromecast is a great way to take kind of mobile interfaces and then beam them right onto my TV. But its interface leaves a lot to be um, desired. You know, I'll often start a YouTube video and then I have to figure out how to turn it off, you know, like I have to reopen a device or, or something. So it's, um, I think Android TV is going to be more of a complete package. And Google's so big now that it just has this problem where these different products bump up against each other. You have the Chrome team, you have the Android team, and as Chrome OS and kind of Android ex expand, they kind of end up being um, in competition in a lot of respects. And so I think with the old Google TV, that wasn't really working out for the Android team. Um, Giga Ohm had a great scoop about Android TV, and they were talking about how just the kind of Android's vision for how they wanted to expand onto TV wasn't really being met by what Google TV was doing. So even internally, there's all this um, debate about how to pursue um, the living room. So I think you'll see both kind of coexist. Mm -hmm. um, but And it's great to see lots more stuff coming to Chromecast. It was a little slow at first, and now we're getting a lot of great services. Um, but it's it's still so low end that I, I see it as just kind of a, almost like a, kind of like a trinket more than say something that people really build into their into their consumption habits. Sort of like a I don't know. Well, I was going to say USB dongle, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, a sure. Platform versus a utility that is convenient. Right. You know, I can imagine like carrying my Chromecast to a hotel and just plugging it in and being able to kind of like use it like that. Um, but not so more kind of portable than necessarily like the kind of thing that I'd want to be my main media solution for streaming. Josh Ong is the U.S. editor over at The Next Web. Thanks so much for coming back on Tech News tonight. And do tell folks where they can keep up with your work. Sure. Find me on Twitter at Beijing Do. That's D-O-U. And, uh, of course, thenextweb.com. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. All right. I mentioned earlier in the show that not everybody likes WWDC, but I'm not just talking about the people who prefer Android or Windows or BlackBerry or Tizen. <laughs> Running out of mobile OSs. Around 20 demonstrators from a local union picketed outside of Apple's big WWDC Monday morning keynote. That was yesterday. They were chanting. They were passing out flyers. The whole idea is that they claim Apple is hurting the local community by not paying its fair share of state taxes. Now, these aren't just a few protesters. There are similar concerns that were raised by Congress that Apple and other tech firms, not just Apple, were using tricks to avoid corporate federal taxes. Some local activists are saying that the country's most successful companies, Apple included, are just not doing their part to improve the communities around them. Now, Tim Cook told lawmakers at a congressional hearing last year that Apple pays every dollar that it owes in taxes and does not rely on, quote, tax gimmicks. It's a little bit of a he said, she said type of a thing. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News today. That's the morning version of our news programming here at Twit. It happens tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.